Good morning. I'm Dr. Shannon Lee from Equine Dental Vets, and this morning I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Stewart. Today Jenny's going to talk to us about big head or nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism, which is an important disease both in Australia and overseas. So and take it away, Jenny. Thanks, Shannon. You can call it NSH. So, Jenny, um, maybe to start with, could you just explain a little bit about big head if I'm a horse owner and I don't really know what that term means? Okay, well big head's probably not a good name for this condition because big head is the end stage of the disease. It's actually a generalised osteoporosis which means the bones become demineralised so the whole, horse's whole skeleton is affected and it's losing calcium but the end stage of the disease, some horses get enlargement of their mandible and facial bones, so it's called big head. And so I guess given that our eyes are a blunt instrument in assessing um, bone density, people only saw it as at the, at the end stage. We didn't know that it was, there was osteoporosis happening um, with a gradual loss of mineralization until at the end we got a big head. But um, And that name was coined in, uh, the early 1900s in England and it was mostly, it was also called Miller's disease because it was mostly the, the Clydesdales or the horses that were owned by Miller's who milled brands and grains and of course fed the horses the byproducts like bran and things which are very um, low in calcium so it was called Miller's disease or big head because that's what we saw. The reason we see it now even though we don't have Miller's horses in London eating mostly bran is that a lot of the pastures we have up the whole eastern seaboard have in them a chemical called oxalate. And the oxalate is part of the plant's nor, uh, normal storage system. It stores minerals like sodium, potassium, um, calcium and magnesium. It stores them in the, as a form of oxalate and that's just part of the normal plant. Um, primarily subtropical grasses. It's a feature of subtropical grasses. The problem for our horses is that the calcium oxalate doesn't break down in the horse's gut. So the horse doesn't have any uh, calcium intake from the pasture. So even though on analysis the pasture looks good, it contains calcium, it's just not available to the horse. And the bond is so strong that the calcium oxalate passes out through the horse and the horse gradually develops the calcium deficiency. So what it does then is it moves calcium out of its bones to try and keep the blood levels what's necessary for heart function, muscle function and life. So gradually the bones get um, demineralized and they get an osteoporosis. Um, I guess another way to think of the oxalate is you know, if we pick up a rock and we know it's got iron and minerals in it, we think, well, I'll eat this rock and it'll give me my iron requirements for the week. Well, you're just not going to break the rock down. And at a microscopic level, that's exactly what the calcium oxalate's like. The, one of the big problems with this disease is it's insidious. It's been around for 1,600 years, or it was first described. It's probably been around since horses evolved. Um, so it's insidious, it can be running along underneath the horse, it's difficult to diagnose and it can mimic other conditions. The big problem is that the treatment is so easy if you get it right and none of the horses need to suffer and a lot of the lamenesses, even just, you know, horses having dental issues, you know, perhaps 10 years before they might have, or having bone and lameness problems 10 years before they might have, you know, it just affects the longevity and it's really heartbreaking. And with young horses, we need that calcium for their bones, we need it for their teeth. And if they don't get those good foundations, then they're gonna have a lifetime of issues, which the owner's gotta deal with, the horse has to suffer, and, this can be prevented and I think that's the really exciting thing so we just have to increase our awareness of it and be aware that it's often in the background when other things are happening. Basically if horses are at risk which really it means if they're grazing um, oxalate pastures which include buffalo, ceteria, kaikuya, purple pigeon grass and there's many other ones um, that means they're at risk. It also does occur though in stabled horses. It's been reported in Hong Kong, it's been reported in Melbourne and in many other countries and in those situations it's because they're having diets high in grain or high in bran which don't have very much calcium in them. So whatever the reason, the problem is that they're not getting enough calcium. 
So what, with um, regardless of the cause of this, uh, what we see are three syndromes. Firstly, you might just see ill thrift where the horse isn't looking as good as it should, the coat's not quite as good and that's thought to be due to uh, dental issues like pain in the in the teeth which reduce the horse's ability to chew and its desire to eat because it's just uncomfortable. It can also be because there is another syndrome which the high oxalate intake can cause kidney damage because some of the oxalates go through the urine as the horse is trying to excrete them. So the first syndrome might just be an ill thrift. The second one uh, is often a shifting lameness. You might just notice horses that um, have a little bit of a, they look a bit lame in one leg and then they know that looks okay and then the next week or two they maybe look a bit lame in the other leg. And the reason for that is that you can, you're getting um, where the tendons and ligaments insert on the bone, there's, it's losing strength. And you can also be getting micro fractures. So as those injuries, those, those injuries heal, because they heal reasonably quickly, the, the lameness goes away and then it might develop in another area. And the problem with that is we see, you know, that, so that's the very mild form of um, lameness problems, but otherwise we can see spontaneous fractures, uh, splints, uh, ruptured suspensory apparatus, you know, ligament damage, tendon damage, so everything to do with the musculoskeletal system. And then the third presentation can be the big head, but that's the end stage. The whole skeleton is, is very demineralised before you get to the big head stage, and the big head stage is more commonly seen in younger horses. So they're the um, presentations that can occur. And then we, if we look at how we can diagnose this, unfortunately there's no diagnostic test that, that is a gold standard or that we can rely upon. We've looked at um, uh, calcium levels in the manure because that's where the calcium is being lost from the pasture that's coming through in the oxalate. We've looked at calcium in urines, we've looked at blood calcium levels. None of those give you any indication of what's happening in the bone. And it's like, I guess, you know, there's blood tests now for conditions in human breast cancer, prostate problems, and our eyes are a blunt instrument, so we rely upon those tests. But unfortunately, there's nothing which will tell us what's going on in the skeleton uh, at the moment. However, we're looking at some tests that, you know, will give us a much better idea of whether the bone's being resolved or not. Prevention, as always, is better than cure, and so what we basically have to do is give the horse what it, its daily calcium intake. Now, there's one problem with using inorganic forms of calcium, like lime and DCP and things, um, and that is that when the oxalate is in, when the horse eats the grass, the oxalate that's bound to sodium or potassium or magnesium will break, will separate in the gut. Um, the calcium oxalate is bound to type, the others will separate it and that free oxalate can then bind to any calcium in the supplement and that's why some manufacturers say to take a horse off the pasture for an hour before and an hour after it receives the supplement because the oxalates in the pasture can grab that supplement especially if it's an inorganic form like lime or DCP. So what that means is that as the oxalate intake goes up <clears throat> the oxalate levels in the pasture vary with the time of year, the stage of growth, um, climate, season, weather and the fertilisation of the paddock. So, But as the oxalate level goes up you've got to add more and more supplements so that which will be taken up by the oxalate before you even begin to meet the horse's daily requirements. So we've looked at um, a protected form of calcium which we know the horse will be getting no matter what's happening in the pasture, no matter how much oxalate or how little calcium it's getting, the, we're using a form of calcium that's chelated so it's protected from the oxalate and it's also prepared for absorption so it's re readily available. The other problem with using um, big doses or big amounts of lime or giving it you know once or twice a week is that there's a limit to amount, the amount of calcium the gut can absorb. It's similar to say you know if you need to drink 10 litres of water over a week saying oh well I'm going to drink all that water on Saturday. Um, there's, you won't absorb it and it's the same with calcium. There's a limit to what the gut can absorb. So the advantages of the chelated form are that it's prepared for absorption so it doesn't have to undergo chelation in the gut cells 
so it's absorbed quicker and there's not such a limit on the amount they can, they can take up each day. Uh, the other problem is that when the horse is starting to get low blood calcium it releases parathyroid hormone and the sole function of that is to move calcium out of the bones to keep the blood calcium levels normal and the parathyroid hormone is also trying to conserve body calcium so and to restore the calcium phosphorus balance so it increases uptake of calcium from the gut that's if the calcium is available and obviously if calcium oxalate the calcium is not available but the parathyroid hormone does that it also depresses phosphorus absorption and it increases phosphorus loss in the urine so the horses actually become phosphorus deficient as well so our role is to replace the daily calcium intake but also to manage and ensure that the phosphorus intake goes up to balance what's being lost from the body. The problem with this um, nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism, which is the um, veterinary medical term for the disease, is that it can min mimic many other conditions. I mean, tons of things can cause ill health, I mean, ill thrift, like dental problems, systemic diseases, um, age, pituitary dysfunction. Um, and so it's really, and, and many things can cause shifting lameness or a bit of pain here and a bit of pain there. And so it's really important to have uh, a, diagno a diagnosis and, it, and, you know, a bit of a, have the veterinary surgeon go through these things because you wouldn't want to miss a dental abscess even, or dental problems, even though they can be, occur because of the, um, the big head disease or the nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism and I guess that's one of the big challenges with this condition is that it can mimic so many other conditions and it's really important that the correct condition is identified and the other thing is you can often have coexisting conditions so you, you might have um, a tendon injury uh, but it's occurred because there's demineralization of the bone so it's really important if you want to get the best management and do the best for your horse and, and get onto it quickly, so it's really important that you have a, a diagnosis from a vet and have any co coexisting problems, um, you know, worked up and managed properly. So if we look at the distribution of the problem, we look at a map of Australia and we can see any areas that have buffalo grass, um, signal grass, kikuyu, ceteria, purple pigeon grass and they're distributed in, in um, regions of Australia. Wherever those grasses are being grazed there's a big chance that there's going to be this underlying problem in the horse population and we just it hasn't been recognised for so long and we need to become more aware of it. So that's been big head in horses. Uh, both here in Australia and overseas, it's an important condition and I hope that you found Jenny's presentation interesting, I certainly have. For more information you can visit www.drjenniferstewart.com So thanks Jenny, we really appreciate it. Thank you Jenny.